Hi, uh, my name is John Kelly. I'm a professor of industrial relations at Birkbeck. I've worked here 14 years. Prior to that, I was at the London School of Economics. I've had a long-standing interest in the labour movements, mainly trade unions, on which I've done a lot of research. I do some teaching for them as well. I've been interested in conflicts, um, strikes, national strikes, general strikes. And I've also been interested in the political wing of the labour movements, the Labour Party and various other political organisations. So the labour movement broadly defined is what I've been researching and often teaching about most of my career. I got interested in the Trotskyist movement on which I've uh, recently published a book uh, quite some years ago. The Trotskyist movement has always been very, very small in Britain, but quite influential, as people say, it punches above its weight. Um, it's, it's represented by organisations like the Socialist Workers' Party or the Socialist Party. Back in the 1980s, the militant tendency was very well known. So it's been very active in the trade union movements, in um, groups like the Anti-Nazi League, Stop the War Coalition. They were both started by Trotskyist movements. So I became increasingly interested over the years in how this movement had managed to survive as a, a revolutionary socialist group, set of groups when the whole project of revolutionary socialism seemed to be dead and buried, particularly after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So I was kind of puzzled as to how it was on the one hand these movements seemed to be spectacularly unsuccessful. There have been no Trotskyist revolutions anywhere. There are no Trotskyist mass parties anywhere. And they haven't ever won an election in any country. So you would think with that record of failure, they would have died out long ago. And yet, strangely enough, they're very resilient. So it's a curious combination of attributes, the, the failure and the resilience. So I ended up analysing them as, as hybrid organisations. They contain elements of the political party. They recruit members. They contest elections. They have elements of the social movement. They try and build broad-based campaigns to fight fascism, to protest the war in Iraq and so on. And they're also sects in the manner of religious sects. They have a set of doctrines, a set of core, hardcore beliefs, if you like, to which they adhere very, very strongly indeed. And like a lot of religious sects, they often spend as much time fighting each other as they do fighting their mainstream opponents, the employers and the, the, the state. So the book is really mapping out the way in which those different elements, the party, the sect, the social movement, interact and explain both the weaknesses of the movement their vote share at elections is generally pitiful and derisory, and yet at the same time, they, uh, they, they are very resilient. They survive and have survived for a very, very long time. I think the main, the main cause of, of, of weakness is that they have a political project and a political programme which is model on Russia 1917. Lenin and the Bolsheviks overthrew the Tsarist government, seized power on the basis of, of armed workers, um, strikes, uprisings, peasant rebellions, at the end of a, towards the end of the First World War, in a, in a situation of turbulence and chaos and political instability. They imagine they could replicate that kind of scenario in Britain in the 21st century, or indeed in many other countries. I think that is fundamentally unrealistic. Britain today is not Russia 1917, and there's no conceivable scenario in which I can foresee it ever will be. So they have a political program that is radically disconnected from the reality of contemporary politics. That's the fundamental source of their weakness. And it's reinforced by their attachment to doctrine. They won't look at the evidence and say, oh, well, actually, this program is no longer valid, or this policy is no longer valid, therefore we need to change them. The doctrine says this is the way you, you achieve power. You follow Lenin, you follow Marx, you follow Trotsky. That is what you must do. And to deviate from that in any way is a terrible thing to do. The source of their resilience is that they do appeal um, to a lot of young people who are disenchanted with the current economic system, disenchanted with the mainstream parties, um, struggling to make ends meet. They're carrying out precarious, badly paid jobs. They're suffering in the mountains of debt. So they have a lot of genuine grievances. And they don't always see the mainstream parties supplying an answer. They see radical parties, the Trotskyist groups, have a complete answer for almost every conceivable question you could ask. Overthrow the capitalist system by uh, an armed revolution. 
And there's always enough people every year running through the university system for whom that kind of millenarian message is very appealing. They're also resilient because they're enormously effective at raising funds. They raise from their members, their total membership, by the way, currently is probably no more than 10,000. The Labour Party, in contrast, around 600,000. So they really are very, very small. But from each of their members, they raise about 10 times as much money as mainstream parties. They're astonishingly efficient at raising funds. That allows them to hire lots of staff, to run an office, to produce newspapers and magazines, and all the placards you see on demonstrations every weekend, many of them are from Trotskyist groups, funded by the, the small group of, of members who put a lot of money into those organizations. They're also resilient because they've created some success stories. So the Anti-Nazi League, the Anti-Poll Tax Federation back in the 80s, the Stop the War Coalition, which is still active today, all these movements which mobilized millions of people were all created by Trotskyists. So they can, when they put their minds to it, actually construct broad-based social movements. But to do that, they have to set aside all their Trotskyist doctrine and build very broad coalitions on very minimal, specific, immediate demands. Stop the rise of the fascists, kill the poll tax, stop the war in Iraq. These are not revolutionary demands. They've got nothing to do with revolution at all. So they can capture a large constituency by saying, let's build a big movement to stop the war and that will mobilize lots of people. Very few of them, it turns out, actually join the Trotskyist parties. That's one of their big problems. Here's a curious thing as to the future of the movement. If you, if you focus only on the weaknesses, you'd be tempted to say they have no future. They've never led a revolution. They've never built an enduring mass party. They've never won an election. Their vote share is always pitiful. Their membership is small and dwindling. So projecting those trends forward, you say, they're going to disappear. That's why you need to look at the resilience at the same time and take into account that these are not only parties, parties that never get any votes eventually disappear, they're also sects and they're also social movements. And it's that complex interplay that generates both the weaknesses and the strengths. So they will have a future. They are very resilient. They generate lots of money. They generate lots of activity. They recruit people who are very committed and for short spells of time, a few years at a time, believe in this cause, believe there is the real prospect of a revolution. And then they quit and they recruit some more people. So there's quite a lot of churn in the organization, a lot of members coming and going, moving in and out very quickly. So they will last a very long time. There's no reason to imagine they'll disappear, but they will also, I think, continue to be enormously weak and relatively ineffective. So that paradoxical combination of failure and resilience actually in one sense, is a recipe for long-term survival, oddly enough. There is something in the idea that, uh, that people become less radical as they grow older, in the sense that if you look at uh, a rally of uh, any Trotskyist organisation, a lot of the people there, particularly the larger groups, are younger people. And if you ask where's their main area of recruitment, overwhelmingly these days it is university campuses. That's, that's their prime constituency amongst which they recruit and attract people. And people are relatively new to politics. People have a sense of anger, who want solutions, who want answers, who are looking for some meaning in their life, will be supplied by the Trotskyist organizations with an entire comprehensive, wide-ranging worldview. And it looks very attractive, it looks very appealing. Um, but typically people realise as they get involved in politics and start to run campaigns, as they move on through life, start families, etc., that actually these answers aren't quite what they seemed and, and that uh, things are a little bit more complex. So they, they drop out. There's a lot of churn in the organisation, a lot of turnover at the bottom end of the organisation. However, there are people who last the course. And so at the tops of all these organisations, you have a small cadre of relatively older people all the Trotskyist groups in Britain today are led by males in their 60s, some of them in their 70s. So there's a small core of people who've lasted the course, joined in their 20s, and they've survived right through to their 60s and 70s. So they present actually quite a, a paradoxical mixture. A lot of young people, a lot of energy and enthusiasm, as it were, in the ranks. But the leadership is an ageing body. 
of mostly white men. I think um, one thing I tried to do was to take seriously a movement that people often deride. People often have very strong views about it. People will say, oh, the Trotskyist movement is, is full of crazy people and wacky people who have bizarre worldviews and they're always fighting amongst themselves and squabbling and they're in irrelevance. They never get any votes. They're, they're of no political consequence. And then there are others who think they're wonderful, they're the only hope for the future, and we should admire them. And what I tried to do was to produce a work of social science that said, we need to take them seriously as a social movement, in the same way that we take religious sects seriously and study them, with a degree of dispassion. In other words, what you're trying to do as a social scientist is to see the world as they see it, to get inside their heads, to try and understand why they make the choices they make, why they act as they do, what are the strengths and weaknesses of their movement. So it's not, uh, I would say, a friendly book. It's not a hostile book either. It's an analytical social science dispassionate study. And I would hope what other people would take from it, apart from anything else, is if you want to study radicalism, whether it's the anarchist, the Occupy movement, or whatever else, leave aside your own personal views about this is wonderful, this is the future, or this is all immature and they'll grow out of it, and take them seriously. Study them as a legitimate object of inquiry, as a social scientist, and think, what concepts do I need to use to try and make sense of this movement? Is this a regular party? Is it a social movement? Is it a network? How do I need to think about and analyze these movements to really throw some light on their strengths and weaknesses? And I hope that other scholars who look at the book will think, that's actually a good way to study social movements, radical movements, protest groups, to have an analytical framework. Mm -hmm.